Um, okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah McNulty. I run uh, the Sci Skype Scientist program. Um, we do a lot of different things uh, in addition to these live streams, like we match classrooms and scientists and run trivia events and a bunch of other things. Um, but today, we are here to talk about conservation with uh, a scientist who is doing so many really cool things um, from advocacy to uh, conservation itself. Um, and that scientist is Al Troutman. Al, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Are you able to turn on your camera? I am now. There you yeah. are. <laughs> awesome. Cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Okay, so we these are how this is how this, these sessions run. You at home are going to really drive what we talk about today because we host these sessions so, you, so that you have the opportunity to talk to a scientist to get your questions answered. So if you have a question, um, Al, as Al introduces himself and starts talking, um, please put them in the Q and A. We will try to get to as many questions as we possibly can over the next forty five minutes or so. Um, so Al, would you like to tell everybody here um, who you are? what you do and why you like it? Yes, so I'm a wildlife biologist and science communicator. Um, so wildlife biologist just means that I study animals and how they interact with their habitat, whether that's their physical interaction or their behavior. And um, I've been doing it for over eight years now. Um, I love it, one, um, because I get to work outside pretty much every day. And two, I get to see a lot of different um, animals, um, some as small as butterflies, others um, as large as sea turtles, and um, sometimes I get to see unique animals like bats that are the only flying mammals. Um, so uh, it's definitely something that I have wanted to do for uh, my whole life as a kid, and I get to live it out every day, and then just being able to be outside um, is uh, one of the perks of it. And then um, lastly, like I get to use my role as a biologist to um, interact with kids like you and show them that um, they too can be scientists. Um, I didn't really have that growing up. Um, so I'm able to interact uh, with kids like you, like I said, to show them that they can be a scientist. It doesn't matter um, your race or your economic status that you too uh, can be a scientist and conservationist like me. Awesome, very cool. So like, when you go outside, uh, first of all, what, what state are you in? So right now I'm in Georgia. I um, just finished up a position out in Louisiana. Uh, I pretty much have been all over the United States and I'm um, even in other countries for my job. Very cool. So when you're going outside, like are you, is your office, I guess, is it on the coast so that you can be going to see both butterflies and sea turtles and all these other critters? Um, so yeah, my office, um, it depends on where I'm working at. Um, so when I was in Louisiana, it was on an 80,000 acre uh, wildlife refuge. Um, it was a hard bottomland forest. So the forest uh, pretty much floods um, um, every now and then, and we manage it um, for different species. And then while I was in Louisiana, not Louisiana, while I was in Wisconsin, my um, office was um, in a wetland management district, and I helped to manage wetlands. Um, it was a little bit easier being in um, Louisiana because my office, uh, although it was 80,000 acres, um, that was one unit. Whereas when I was in um, Wisconsin, it was my office was um, in one area, but I helped manage 43 waterfall production areas uh, that was a part of the district. Um, so it really just depends. Sometimes my office is on a boat uh, when I'm working as an endangered species observer. Sometimes we're as close as five miles offshore, or sometimes it's up to 22 to 25 miles offshore. Um, so I live on that boat for three weeks to three months at a time, floating around, um, working. That's really cool. So it sounds like your job is really variable, like different days are wildly different from each other. Yes, it is. Yeah, um, it's it's definitely variable. I mean, during some season it's the same, but um, depending on the job, um, like some days we can uh, be in the field bird band, and, and other days uh, we are like going out and rescuing uh, <clears throat> rescuing snakes from 
uh, erosion control fabric. Um, so it really depends on the actual position and then the state um, that's in. And like um, when I'm working on the coast of Texas, uh, my job um, is varies from looking for um, nesting and stranded sea turtles to um, releasing hatchlings and interacting with the public. Um, so it really just depends on what area I'm in, uh, what my day-to-day -day, um, looks like. Very cool. So we got a question from Garden Spot High School. How did you become a biologist and what classes in college did you take and like how did you start out? How did this all come to be? Yeah, so um, it started out like as a kid, like I enjoy nature and for, I actually thought I was going to be a vet because I didn't have anybody that looked like me working with animals besides uh, people who were vets. Um, like growing up, I would go to the zoo and watch like Steve Orr and Jeff Corrin, if you guys know who those are. Um, but um, I thought I wanted to do that, but they didn't look like me. Um, so for a long time, like I said, I thought I was going to be a vet. And then I got to college um, and realized I didn't want to be a vet um, because of the depression rate. So I switched to middle grades education and a minor in biology. And then a, I took a field biology course um, called ornithology, which is the study of birds. And we were outside every class period. I'm looking at birds and identifying them. And I was like, you know what, I, I want to do this. So I actually switched my major back to um, biology from uh, middle grades education and continued on with that and graduated. And then I got an internship with the Student Conservation Association. And then um, I, after that, I got a job with the Fish and Wildlife Service up in Wisconsin. So I took a lot of animal related classes. Um, I took obviously ornithology, I took mammalogy, which is a study of mammals. I took comparative vertebrate anatomy, uh, anatomy which is a study of animals, like anatomy of their bones. Um, I took wildlife management, uh, I took a lot of animal-based classes. Um, I took some plant-based classes, um, but I wanted to be a wildlife biologist. So I, at that time I thought, you know what, let's take as many animal classes that I could um, because my school actually didn't have like a dedicated wildlife or animal um, program. So I took all those classes that I thought um, would get me into um, that position. And then I also got a lot of animal handling experience from, um, working and uh, volunteering at a free range organic cattle farm. Um, in high school, I did a lot of volunteering at um, pet shelters. Um, I helped um, work and organize a program for homeless pets in high school. Um, and then obviously working at the zoo and getting that animal handling experience um, helped me to um, become a wildlife biologist. Very cool. Yeah, I think one like unifying thing among a lot of the stories that we hear from scientists is that the path from where you all are at now in school to becoming a scientist is not always a straight line. Like you might think for a while you're going to be a doctor, or you're going to be a vet, or you're going to do something else. And then you decide to change and changing is possible and it, you're not stuck in one thing just because you've made some class choices um so yeah don't I wouldn't tell people to stress too much about uh the choices you make now because you can always alter it right exactly like the path to success is not like a ladder it's more like a, a latrice where there's different um horizontal paths that can lead you to the direction you want to go so you don't have to stay on that one ladder, but you can actually move vertical, I mean, horizontal to a different path in order to get to your um, position that you want to be or even in life goals. For sure. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, the next question is from Regan. Uh, I live in Michigan. Is this a good location for me to become a marine biologist? It seems like studying the Great Lakes would be something a marine biologist might do. Well, yes. Um, so the Great Lakes, although they are like freshwater, they have a lot of marine impacts um, from boats coming in, but also there's some invasive species um, like lampreys that will come in from the ocean into the, um, the Great Lakes. And Michigan actually is one of the states, um, since it is on the coast with the Great Lakes, um, they have a program called Sea Grant, uh, which helps uh, people to um, get marine biology experience. So uh, while you're not technically on the ocean, you still can get that experience. And also, like, 
where you live at is not necessarily what you have to say. So um, you can go anywhere and get experience. Um, but if you want to stay home, Michigan um, does have programs where you can become a marine biologist. Yeah. And a lot of times like the, the skills, like you're gaining skills as much as you're gaining direct experience with the ocean. Like, like Al said, you know, he worked at a pet shelter and he worked on a farm and like those sorts of things, um, you don't have to be near the ocean to do, but then when you go to get a job working with animals that live in the ocean, all those skills are so useful. And so you can build your skills from wherever to get a job doing what you really want to do. Um, we've had a couple questions that all kind of dance around the same thing. Um, what's like the weirdest thing you've seen working near the ocean? Um, I would say one of the weirdest thing, um, um, let's see, that's a good question. Um, I guess the first weirdest like thing I've seen uh, was a, a creature that I saw, um, a, a guitar fish. Um, it had been during a dredging operation, uh, it was dug up. Um, so that was my first time um, seeing that. And then um, some of the other weird things, um, I mean, I guess it's, it was weird, but it's not really too weird, but we was digging up and we pulled up like car axles and refrigerators from the bottom of the ocean. So it was kind of weird because we were like 15, 20 miles offshore and we're pulling up like these um, human like built self and like, like what is this doing out here? And it was, it was kind of weird. Um, so that's kind of one of the weird, weirdest things I see. Uh, most of the stuff that I see is pretty typical um, around the ocean. Um, it's some of the like cool things I saw that's not really weird is seeing like giant birds called magnificent frigid birds like fly over the boat and see where like, I get to see how big they are. Or then like um, a lot of times like gulls and pelicans um, sometimes will swim behind the boat or fly behind the boat and um, catch the fish that are being stirred up or things like that. So that's pretty fascinating to see. Awesome. So one of the other questions um, have been like, how many animals do you see a day? And what's your favorite animal to encounter on the job? Um, yeah, so it really depends on um, the, I guess, location again and what animal I'm working with as timing I see a day. Um, there's sometimes where I, I don't necessarily see um, any animals. Um, it's all, all forests or all frozen, frozen uh, wetlands of uh, Wisconsin. And then there's other times where I can see easily over uh, 50 to 60 different animals. Um, and sometimes like it's not necessarily the intended animal I'm working with. Sometimes it's like I'm working with sea turtles, but I'm seeing a lot of migratory birds that are coming up and resting on the beach. Um, those days it actually could be up to a hundred or more um, different um, birds and um, different species as well. Um, so it really depends on the location, but um, some days it's like I said, it's zero. Other days it's uh, 50 to hundred or more. Right. And so it, it just depends on um, that either um, like every animal I get to see, I'm, I'm excited about. Um, like I finally got to see like a Louisiana black bear last year. And um, I got to see, I was there for up until January. And I probably saw around like 10 to 12 of them. And there's wow. people who live in Louisiana that have still never seen one. So, I didn't yeah. even know that black bears lived in Louisiana. I had no idea. That's so cool. Amazing. Um, our next question is from Christy. Are there a lot of jobs available for zoologists and wildlife biologists? Um, <laughs> that's a tricky question. So yes, um, there are, I would say, a lot of jobs available, but there's also a lot of people that are competing for those jobs. And then secondly, those jobs, they're always, they might not always be permanent jobs. They're seasonal and turn, which means they're short term, they're not on blown turn. Um, so while there are a lot of jobs, there are a lot of people that are competing for them um, other than like me or if you were competing for a job. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot, but there's also a lot of us that um, want those jobs. 
Um, but hopefully by the time you get there, there'll be a lot more jobs. And um, depending on funding, there could be more jobs created. Um, so yeah. Awesome. Uh, a number of classrooms, including uh, uh, the Brockman classroom has asked, uh, what is your favorite thing about your job? Um, my favorite thing about the job, uh, one is I'm definitely working with the different types of animals that I, I have had the chance to work with. Um, and two, being outside and three, um, obviously like my job takes me to many different states and sometimes other countries. So I get to meet a lot of different people from different areas. And then also I get to taste a lot of different foods um, that I never have the chance to taste. So um, those are the top three um, that are my favorite part of my job, um, especially the food and traveling part. And then like, I already have a passion for animals. So of course that's gonna be one of the top. Yeah, that's awesome. Ugh, I, I've traveled for work in the past, but don't do it as much anymore. And I miss it a lot. Um, one of the questions is where do you go? So like, where was the farthest you've been for work? Um, and tell us about that. Yeah, I would say the farthest I ever been currently is um, the island of Borneo, uh, which is a pretty unique island. It's uh, like, owned by three different countries. It's part of Malaysia, um, Brunei is on that island, as well as Indonesia. I was in the Malaysian part of Sabah, Borneo. Um, so I was there working with bats. Uh, we were doing a diversity and abundance study, looking to see what bats were inhabiting the areas of the Crocorane National Forest. So we was looking at insectivores and uh, fruit bats. So insectivores are the ones that eat insects and fruit bats um, eat fruit. Uh, so we have to use two different trapping methods to um, catch these bats in order to study them. Um, it was it was probably like the most like ch challenging work at first um, because we were climbing up a mountain multiple times a day, setting up traps. Um, and we would go up like around four o'clock to set up the net. And then we wouldn't come down till sometimes midnight or later, um, depending on how many bats we had to uh, collect and process. And then we'll wake up at around seven o'clock to go back up the mountain because we were leaving some of the traps up um, throughout the night to catch any of those ones that were flying still. So we'd have to go back up and check those traps and process those bats. And then we'll move the traps up to the next location um, and stage them for the day and then go take a nap, eat, and go back up the mountain. Uh, we were utilizing two different um, methods. We were utilizing a mist net, which is basically a giant net. It's um, kind of thin and then bats will fly into it and then we would take them out and then we're using what's known as a heart trap, which is basically a giant window frame. And then you wrap fishing line around it so it has tension and then the bats fly into it, the fishing line, fall down to a bag um, that's up under the trout, and then you can get them out that way. Do one of those types of nets hurt the bat less? Um, well, it's for two different um, bat, um, two oh, different okay. types of bats. So one of them is for like the flyways, um, and those are most like, we're getting like our fruit bats in there, and then the other one is for the insectivores. Um, but, I mean, both of them, we try to get them out um, as fast as possible. Uh, yeah. With the heart trap, they actually have like a covering um, on the ledge so they can actually go up and like hide um, and like pretty much kind of roost and hide in the um, bag. And then the, the mist net, uh, we, um, we are there to make sure we get them out um, right then and there. And it's not left up at night because um, we definitely don't want our bats to get hurt. Yeah, yeah. I, I worked with bats for one summer and used mist nets. And yeah, it's just, it's wild how many bats you can catch in an area that you don't even know has bats. It's like, right. Unbelievable. <laughs> it is. Yeah, it's crazy. It is wild. Um, yeah, and then sometimes the nets actually catch unintended animals and you get to see something cool. Like we caught a flying squirrel um, in Borneo and it was actually had never been recorded um, in that national park before um so it was pretty cool it, it tore up our net that it was pretty cool to see amazing i also saw some of the most amazing moths i've ever seen in my life 
with nest nets. We would see these huge Luna moths and other big moths. It was really, really cool. Um, all right, the next question is from Valley School. They're a fifth grade classroom. Have you ever had a life-threatening experience on the job? Is being a wildlife biologist dangerous? Um, it is, um, but it depends on how you handle um, your job. Um, most of the time it's not dangerous. It's, well, it's not technically dangerous, but there are still elements that um, you need to be aware and safe, um, safety because. Um, so uh, one dangerous moment is I, I had um, was I actually, it's just kind of funny now, but um, I, I choked on a carrot while, while driving um, a UTV. Because <laughs> um, like we're, we're like traveling down the, the beach, like 60 miles, I'm looking for sea turtles. And um, I was, I was trying to eat my, eat my lunch and I, I choked on a carrot and um, that, that scared me. So I don't eat carrots anymore while driving. <laughs> the and unexpected then, dangers of the job right, right yes and then really another scary. um like dangerous uh, moment is i'm um, like walking on a, a frozen pond and um it actually like cracked on me um thankfully it was like just the edge um but i was walking um i made it all the way across and i was coming back from checking a predator guard uh, which is like a instrument we put on like um, dug boxes to keep predators from coming up and I'm messing with the nest but I was reinstalling that and I was walking back and literally like a foot from the shore like my the ice cracked up under me I went um, pretty much like thighs deep into like water and mud I bet thankfully I had uh, waders on um, so it, it wasn't too bad it was a little cold um, but um, that's some one safety issue that um, you have to be aware of like you never know like even if you walked on it a million times, like it can change uh, in an instant over the day with sunlight and temperatures. Um, so you have to be aware and know about that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, then another time I was in Borneo. Um, it wasn't really dangerous, but um, it was more uh, inconvenient and a little bit, I guess, scary. Uh, we were working up the bats and uh, we were in a rainforest, so obviously it's gonna rain. Um, but there, most of the rainstorms had been during the like daytime, early evening. So we were up around like 11 o'clock at night um, processing bats. And then um, it started to sprinkle. So like, all right, well, we were like, oh, that looks kind of like that. I'm like, all right, we got to hurry up, pack up things. So we we're just packing stuff up. And then it just started storming. So we hurry up and packed up stuff. And we started like trying to walk down the mountain. I uh, bet we really couldn't see in front of ourselves because it was raining so hard. So we were like, trying to touch and hold each other's back as we were walking down um, the mountain. It was like, it was a couple of miles like back down to the research station. And like, we couldn't see because the rain was coming from like sideways and our headlamp, I uh, wasn't any help uh, with the rain. Um, so that was a kind of scary and dangerous moment um, that we laughed about it. Um, after we were done, it was like, oh, uh, we're, we're real researchers now. We finally got caught in a torrential downpour. Yeah, that, you are describing a thing that happened almost exactly to me when I was working with bats. It started to rain and we had like, you know, so to, to put up a mist net, at least the way we did it back then was with big metal poles that you put together and then the net goes in the middle. Um, to picture a mist net, you almost want to picture a badminton net, but thinner and taller and droopier. Um, but like, it's kind of what it looks like. And so it was like, we were in, New in the middle of nowhere in New York and it was just like thun lightning, lightning, lightning as we're running through this field with lightning and big metal poles. And I was like, this is how I die. I'm gonna get uh, grilled to a crisp over here. Anyway, uh, but enough about me. Next question, General Franks Elementary. As a wildlife biologist, it seems like you're moving around all the time. You're going to these wild places. Do you still get time to see your family or meet new friends? Um. Yeah, so again, this depends on <laughs> where you're at. Um, so most of my jobs, um, I do meet a lot of new people um, many times because it's I'm like the new person. Um, I'm the only person who looks like me in the area and I'm coming up. Um, but a lot of the jobs I've worked in the past were like seasonal or term positions. So I'll be there for a couple of months or a year or so. And then I can come back home during my off time and visit my family. Um, and then like when I was working as an endangered species observer, um, I only spent um, 
three weeks to three months at a time working. And then other time I would um, be at home uh, visiting family and traveling, enjoying life. Um, but um, when I was in Louisiana, um, it was actually a little different because like I said, I was surrounded by 80,000 acres of woods and the nearest town um, was 30, 40 minutes away. Um, and then like, um, I didn't really have any cell phone service. So it was, it was kind of hard like meeting new people because um, it was also a smaller, a smaller, older town. Uh, so most of the time, I pretty much stayed on the refuge uh, throughout the week. And then on the, my weekends, I would go and explore um, South Louisiana uh, to a more populated area. Um, but you do get to meet a lot of new people. Um, like some jobs are work. Um, it's 20 other people that are working um, on the team. So you can meet people from all over. I mean, other jobs, it's Larry, me, and someone else. Right. Yeah. It can be very variable in wildlife biology. Um, we have a couple questions that are asking uh, similar things. So you've mentioned a couple of times that oftentimes on the job, you are the one person that looks like you. Uh, um, uh, let's see. The questions here are, um, did you feel like there were obstacles in your path because of this? And do you want to talk a little bit about Black and Marine Science or any of the other advocacy work around that that you've done in your life and how people could check that out? Yes, yeah, so I mean, I definitely think there's obstacles in place uh, because of where I grew up and um, being a, a black person um, in this field. Um, it's there's definitely like some one obstacle is definitely like um, finances. Um, like growing up and uh, even in college, like there's a lot of internships available, but a lot of them are unpaid or you have to pay to actually do the internship. And uh, for me, that definitely wasn't an option, like to go out and pay to work or um, to like do an internship for, for free. I still had um, my courses I had to pay for. So I needed to actually work. Um, and then many times like the internships are giving good experience that, um, if I can't afford those internships or afford to not work for the summer and do the internships, well, I'm not gonna get the, that experience for a job that I will need later um, down the road. A lot of jobs don't want you to have this ex experience, but how can you get the experience uh, if these internships are not available for you? Um, and then um, another thing is like, like I said, like many times I am the only person who looks like me or only person of color um, in my offices, in my um, area that I work at. So a lot of times um, it is um, lonely sometimes, or it's hard to find a connection or community. I'm like, they're, sure there are good people, but a lot of times um, they still don't really understand like the where I'm coming from, my mannerism. And it's, it's a hassle to explain uh, why is the way I do things or um, why I eat, eat certain foods or even if those foods are even available um, in the area I am. Um, so <clears throat> it's, it's a lot that um, there are now like different resources out there that are helping to uh, not only like provide internships and experiences, but also to connect other um, black and people of color scientists to each other um, and um, to kids as well. And one of those, um, organization is Black and Marine Science. I'm the chief management officer for that. And Black and Marine Science, um, we all are a group of marine scientists. Some of us work with sea turtles, some of us work with coral, and others work with like environmental DNA. Um, but we are, we came about through a, um, during the time, I guess, like with other Black and X weeks, like Black Virgus Week, which was created when a um, white woman called the police on a um, black birder who was in Central Park. Um, he basically just told her like, hey, um, could you put your dog on a leash? Like she was in an area of the park um, that dogs would have to be required on a leash and he was birding, but she called the police on him and um, said that he was threatening her uh, uh, being aggressive and it wasn't anything like that, but um, that's a, it's, it happens a lot for black people where um, we are either, either have the police called on us 
or we can't enjoy nature uh, without being harassed, without asking, like, why are we here? What are we doing? Like, and, or sometimes we have to be, um, I guess, proactive and make ourselves seem nicer um, or more friendly than what we are by going about waving at people or wearing bright colors to not look like um, a threat or we're up to no good. So through that um, interactions with uh, Chris Cooper and the lady who got the police on him, um, there were several black and hat tweets um, that came about um, to pretty much say like this is this is not a like a this is a semi common occurrence for um, black people and people of color, um, and we're here to um, pretty much like kind of put a stop to it, make it aware. Then also we're here to unite um, as nature enthusiasts, as um, scientists, um, that we can all have a a common uh, spot to meet up at. Um, a common org and community um, that focuses on uh, connecting us to each other, but also highlighting, amplifying uh, Black voices, Black scientists, Black nature enthusiasts. Um, and it has been like great so far. Like before, was, like I knew there was other people out there who worked as a wildlife biologist and marine scientists, um, but um, I couldn't I couldn't find them and through that, I have found like hundreds of other black and people of color scientists. And then like, there's a couple of people in marine science that literally like our research stations are, le are like 20 to 30 miles apart. And we will never met until black marine science. Um, so now I, I actually sit on the board of black marine science with them. But throughout this org, we, uh, we would have not we would not have probably would not have met or been later on in life uh, if, we, if we would have met at all. Um, but through Black Marine Science, we were able to meet. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it, whatever it is that you are interested in at home, like there's probably a Black in for you. Like there's Black in neuro, there's Black in cancer biology, like all, all of the things. Um, so you can usually just Google that, like black in and then type the thing that you like and see if it'll come up. Um, in the chat, I've put a link to uh, Black and Marine Science and as well, um, another organization uh, called uh, Miss Elasmo. Elasmo uh, is short for Elasmobranch, which is a which is like sharks and their relatives. So it's um, minorities in shark science. They're another really cool bunch of people. Um, cool, thank you, thank you for answering that. Um, the next question is from Jill Ruiz. Uh, what's the main ecological challenge or issue that you work with the most? Um, I mean, I guess for me, um, it would have to be habitat uh, loss and habitat degradation. A lot of the species um, that I've worked with um, have either their species have declined because of farming practices or um, building um, communities. So like when I worked with the Fish and Wildlife Service, my main focus was the Carnar Blue Butterfly, which is a small butterfly that used to be throughout uh, many states up in the Midwest, all the way towards New York. So like Wisconsin, Indiana, Ohio, and New York. Um, but now their range is pretty much dwindled down to small hot spots. So they are what's known as extirpated, which is locally extinct. Um, so they're not, the whole species haven't been extinct, but they're not no longer in the area that they were historically, their home range. Um, so a lot of my job is to, is focusing on reestablishing that population and doing things that will help that population thrive. Um, so a lot of, um, habitat restoration, which is manipulating the land, um, using chainsaws, thinning the forest, um, spraying undesirables um, on wood um, and treating them with herbicide, mechanically pulling invasive species, and then a lot of mowing and planting um, seeds for them. And then my, um, my actual master's work was in habitat um, loss as well, or looking at the effects that sea level rise and habitat loss is gonna have on um, seaside sparrows. Um, they're a bird down on the coast of Georgia 
Um, my ha my project was looking at their actual diet. So they the offsprings eat arthropods, which are soft body organisms like um, insects, arachnids, spiders. Uh, so my project was looking at what they're eating um, or in what they're eating and feeding the offspring and comparing that to what's available uh, throughout the whole marsh. And then um, the sea level is rising. So eventually um, what they're eating um, will decline, which in turn will cause the bird species to decline. And on top of that, um, a lot of coastal areas are actually being developed. Um, so now they have these two pressures of sea level rise, but also coastal development that is gonna take out their um, habitat. Right. All right, thank you for that. Um, so there's a lot of kids at home watching this and people here care about conservation because they showed up to the conservation session. So are, do you have any advice for classrooms for um, how you can help with ecological challenges that people are facing now and animals are facing? Um, yeah, so uh, I guess a couple ones is like, um, if you're uh, fishing, um, pick up your fishing line, just like, uh, dispose of it properly and not only can mess up with aquatic animals but also um, animals like birds who can get entangled in it uh, or even ingest it. Um, don't feed ducks um, bread. Um, it's not good for them. Uh, it can cause a, um, a kind of a disease called angel wing where their wing doesn't um, grow all the way and render it useless so they can't fly. And um, it doesn't really have any nutritional value for them. If you are going to feed ducks, feed them like veggies, um, apples without the seeds in them. Uh, but it's best to just let them forage on their own um, and, and don't feed them at all. Don't feed pretty much any wildlife. Um, <clears throat> don't release your pets. Um, goldfish, um, there's no natural predators for them. Um, so if you release them in the pond, um, they could overpopulate the pond and take over like there's a big problem with that out west, especially in states like Colorado, where goldfish, um, they have just taken over the ponds because they don't have the natural predators and they grow um, faster than a lot of other fishes that we have here. Um, also, don't take any animals away from the wild. Um, so don't take like box turtles. Uh, that was a past times where people would keep box turtles. And um, going back to releasing pets, like um, there's a lot of uh, marine, like, shops or gift shops on like beaches and stuff that will give out or you have buy um uh, is it the red ear slider turtles um a lot of people get those things there too and realize that turtles live for a long time up towards the 50 to 100 years depending on the turtle and they don't want to keep up with them so they'll release them and that can also cause a problem because sometimes these areas that are these red air sliders are being released or they're not native um to the area so they have a problem similar to the goldfish um and then like if you ever see a turtle like one make sure that you know it's a turtle and not a tortoise um so turtles have more of a streamlined back and it's not domed um that you also if you don't know what the turtle is you never want to pit it in the water um and then if you're getting a turtle off the road um make sure you always take it and release it in the way that's facing, the direction that's facing, um, because if you take it back to the other way, it's just gonna try to call back. It was facing that way for a reason. Um, so go ahead and put it back, put it in the area that it was facing. Um, and then also like um, do your best to recycle and even go on a step like try not to use, um, for me, like I try not to get food that has more packaging than actual food. Um, so limit, like, limit your use and try to watch what you're buying. And then like, um, sometimes it's, it may cost more, but it's better to buy the bulk items and then just use your own uh, reusable packaging or cups to take them with you instead of buying all those single use um, packaging, you just buy one bulk and separate it into your own um, separate containers. Yeah. Awesome. All good suggestions. Um, all right. So we have a bunch of questions that are like, have you seen this? Have you seen this? Have you seen this? So how will we do a rapid fire? Have you worked with this animal? Are you ready? Okay. Yeah. okay. Have you worked with endangered animals? Yes. Have you worked? Have you seen a horseshoe crab? I have a bunch of them. 
<laughs> yeah, I have um, a really little one that I found. Uh, I think it might, it's a malt uh, that I have in the freezer from last year. Anyway, uh, I should, this is rapid fire, Sarah. Have you seen a shark? I have, yes. Have you seen a creature from deep, deep in the ocean? Um, maybe not too deep, but I think I would say yes. Yeah, um, let's say yes. <laughs> Probably. Um, do you have pets? Yes, I have a dog. Have you seen an anglerfish? I have not, but I want to. I have an anglerfish over here, but it's very dead and it's in a jar. Um, so we can check anglerfish off digitally for you right now. All right, here oh, is no. an anglerfish. You can see he's he's kind of, he's like this right now. Yeah. He's like this. Um, so this is, is that's his little angler doodad, that little guy right there. Yeah. And there's his teeth. Um, yeah, my uh, PhD advisor collected him, and then um, he, he's a little more banged up. Or she, I'm sorry. Th this is a <laughs> female. Um, the males are are very small uh, and like just kind of stick on the female's underside. Um, Anyway, Cotter, uh, she's a little banged up. So he was like, you can use this for science communication. And I was like, yes. So now I have an anglerfish in my office. Um, okay, cool. So we've seen a shark. We've seen a horseshoe crab. We're doing, we've worked with uh, animals. Doing pretty good. Okay. Um, so we try to keep these to 45 minutes. Oh, and where are you originally from? Aurora Elementary would like to know. I'm from Austell, Georgia. Georgia. So you're back in the state that you grew up in. That's always I nice. am, yes. Very cool. Um, okay, so oh, wolf. Have you seen a wolf? Um, allegedly. So I saw allegedly. Black, <laughs> I saw a black large canine. Um, but I wasn't sure if it was a wolf or not. But I'm gonna say it was because I was in northern Wisconsin and it kind of just flew by, but it was bigger than a dog. So I'm gonna say it was a, a wolf. A probably, um, yeah. That sounds yeah. sounds like a wolf to me. Oh, wait, actually, I have seen a wolf, but it was at a zoo. Yeah, at Como Zoo. But my goal is to see some at Yellowstone this year. Very cool. Well, I hope you, you see one, like, very definitely for sure in the future, so you can check that off the bucket list confidently. Um, okay, so we like to ask everybody the same two questions at the end of each session. The first question is, if you had everyone's attention in the whole world and you could tell them one piece of information that relates to your area of expertise, what would it be? Oh, man, this is a lot to narrow it down. Um, I would say that my one piece of um, advice um, would be that, <clears throat> oh my gosh, this is a lot. Um, I would say that um, uh, we, we have the ability um, and um, the ability to, save uh, um, many more species than what we are, but uh, we are not doing a good job of being a steward um, to the earth, um, whether it be financially, um, the way that we're using the resources and some of the elected officials we are electing. Uh, so we need to do a, a better job of, with our stewardship to the earth to make sure that all the animals that are here are here for future generations. So we're borrowing it from they're from them. Very good answer. All right, now we have an even broader question. You still have everyone's attention in the world and you can still tell them whatever you want, but it can be about anything. It can be about literally anything. It can be related to your area of expertise or just your favorite piece of information. What do you tell them? Um, I would tell them two things. One, pineapple does go on pizza. Yes, and... it does. <laughs> yes, it does. Yes, and um, drums are better than flax for wings, so yeah. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Those are both essential pieces of information. Thank you so much. Um, is there anything else you'd like to uh, plug or let everybody know about before we wrap up? Um, yeah, I mean, I would just give some advice, um, like um, get ready, to, if you want to be in school, get ready to get out of your comfort zone, like um, a smooth, um, like Harvard never made like a skillful um, seller. Then like boats are meant to go like out to sea, not stay in the harbor. So get ready to get out of your comfort zone. Um, you gotta be flexible um, and just stick to your passion um, and be 100% you. Um, you never know what's gonna lead you. That's great. I have that quote. Um, 
on the a smooth scene never made a uh, skilled sailor i watercolored it and put it in my office so uh right. love that one very good uh, all right well thank you so much um we really appreciate it everybody at home um you can sign up to get matched with your own scientist for your classroom if your question didn't get answered today we tried to get through as many as we possibly could but there were more than we could get to you can always do that i put the link in the chat you can get your own scientist in your own classroom um you can continue coming to these sessions next week we're going to be talking all about primates with natalia reagan so you have that to look forward to that'll be on groundhog day at 1 p.m eastern 10 a.m pacific um, so I hope to see you all there. Thank you all for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you, Kay, for interpreting for us. And thank you, Al, for all of your wisdom and knowledge. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Of course. Okay. Bye. Bye.